welcome to the LinkedIn agency Conclave Part by Exchange for Media. Uh, my name is Santosh Krishnamurti and I'm the head of the agencies for LinkedIn in India. Uh, we are really, really excited to have you all today. Thank you so much for taking out time and coming and seeing, seeing us. Uh, agency Conclave, like I mentioned, this is the first ever agency conclave in India. Uh, originally designed to be an on-ground event, we thought we'll come and see you, shake hands, share some stories. I'm sure every one of us has some of the other inspirational stories in the last couple of years. Uh, things have changed personally and professionally. Uh, professionally, it's, it has changed in the last four or five years where we've seen that the digital marketing has taken a, taken a, a huge leap. And we thought that we will address all that in today's uh, conclave. We have one and a half hours with us and we have a packed agenda. Uh, I'm really excited by the kind of the kind of conversation we are going to hear today uh, from the agency, from the agency ecosystem leaders, as well as from the LinkedIn leadership. At the same time, at the same time, we are really excited that we are going to get some nuggets from the leaders to how to look forward and, and see that what's in store for us. But with that, I actually am really, really proud to uh, introduce you to the team, the agency team of the LinkedIn Marketing Solution in India. Uh, can I have a slide, please? Yes, perfect. So this is this is your agency team in India. Uh, like I said, I'm Santosh. I had I had the agencies. I have Vijit Shetty joined with me. Vijit is the agency lead based of Bombay, takes care of holding companies, and I have Harry Sangha, who is the independent agency lead based in Delhi. We are really, really happy to take any questions during the conclave if you have, or after that also you want to reach out to us. You can you can look look for us at the LinkedIn, uh, send us the connection, and we'll be very happy to start the conversation. Uh, the team has put this uh, put this conclave together uh, to share the knowledge and to learn from the leaders from us. With that, I would just like to deep dive on the agenda. Can I have the agenda slide, please? Perfect. Uh, we'll start with the, the the macro trends, which we which actually is going to define the next next probably ten years uh, from the B two B I Institute, which is a think tank of LinkedIn. Uh, who better than Alex to take that? Alex Aboy is the director of agency and channel sales for APAC based out of Singapore. Uh, Post that, uh, we have a conversation which is which we all are very interested about in today's scenario, which is the trust based marketing and how the leaders are looking at post-pandemic recovery. We have Prashant Kumar, the CEO of South Asia Group M. We fondly know him as PK. He's very grateful that he actually took out time to speak to us. Uh, Sachin Sharma, who's the Director of Enterprise LinkedIn Marketing Solution India, and, and Nawal, uh, co-founder of Exchange for Media, will be speaking to these two gentlemen. And I'm sure we will get a lot of insight how leadership has looked during pandemic, talking to their customers, talking to their, uh, their, their own people. Post that, brand marketing is something which we have always been talking about, the top of the funnel marketing. Uh, we wanted to actually get an agency's point of view. Manoj Rajwani will be the uh, session chair. Manoj is the director of Bid Market SMB at LinkedIn Marketing Solution India. He will be talking to Vinod Thadani, the chief digital growth officer of Densu Media and the CEO of iProspect. Uh, Chandi Shah, the founder and the chief operating officer of Kinect. Aditi Mishra, the chief strategy officer of Lodsa, and Bharat Khatri, who has just taken over as the chief digital officer of APAC Omnicom. What I'm more excited about this group is that this group is actually going with, with a very diverse uh, knowledge and diverse experiences. They are going to really give us some most of the point of view, uh, all about an, uh, uh, the agency's point of view, which will be help us. Uh, we, are, we are okay with question and answers. Please let us know. Uh, with that, I think I would like to call upon Alex to tell us what to look forward in the next 10 years in the decade in 2030. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Santosh, for this great introduction. Um, I'm delighted to welcome everybody to the very first India Agency Conclave organized by LinkedIn. I'm excited to be introducing some of the biggest trends uncovered by LinkedIn B2B Institute, which are uh, going to help accelerate business to business relationship. We've worked with the, uh, some of the brightest marketing minds in the world to enable marketers to deliver uh, more value. 
I'm Alex Sibois, I'm the APAC head of Agency and Channel Sales. And uh, for the next 20 minutes, I will present to you three of those uh, trends. Uh, they will be mega trends, which we believe are the most uh, impactful and contrarian uh, trends. And we will invest in those trends in the next 10 years and we're hoping that these will become uh, references to the B2B marketing world. So let me share a little bit of, uh, of context to start with to set us for success. So marketers often ask the same questions. What is everyone else doing? This is actually the wrong questions. What you should be asking is, what is everyone not doing yet? If you're looking at the matrix, you will see that you can be either right or wrong. And you can be, have consensus with everybody, or you can be contrarian against the people. If you're wrong, you're wrong and you're not going anywhere. If you're right, while you have consensus, this is great, but ultimately you're not delivering much uh, value. What you want to do is be right and be contrarian, so you can foresee the trends before everybody else. So at LinkedIn uh, B2B Institute, what we've been doing in the last five years is just exactly that, of uh, defining those biggest trends in the market, which although they may not be widely used today, we believe they will become the benchmark of B2B marketing in the long term, in the next 10 years. And that's where uh, we're trying to basically share those uh, discoveries with every one of you today. So um, the three biggest market trends that I would like to cover today with you are the most durable and the most contrary. We're talking about the war on brand, blockbuster marketing, and the death of hyper-targeting. If you follow Jeff Bezos, um, you may have noticed that often he's been asked the same question, what will change in 10 years? And this is actually something he doesn't want to answer because his reasoning is very simple. The only way to plan and build a performing business, future success, hypergrowth, is by planning based on what will not change. So this is what we're going to do with our trend, assuming that these will not change and are the consistent conundrum for your future B2B marketing strategies. So let's start with the first trend, the war on brand. And this trend is actually all about the right balance between short-term activation and long-term brand. If you're considering short-term activation, which uh, will deliver its full potential roughly uh, over a period of six months, uh, you will have great results very, very quickly, but over time, after six months, not much more will be delivered. Whereas while brand marketing starts delivering its value, longer term, this is where you're going to see a real difference. Now, the big question is, who are the marketers who actually look at their campaigns and the performance that they generate beyond six months? Actually, our research has uh, uncovered that no more than 4% of B2B marketers are actually measuring beyond six months. And consequently, brand marketers are actually losing the budget battle because 95% of the budgets used are actually performance-based budgets, and mostly uh, based on CPC. So we've looked for the right balance between brand and activation budgets. And we've realized that uh, we're roughly at 50% uh, on each side with a slight benefit to the activation side. But if you're considering the current trends, B2B buyers are mostly now doing their own research. And what they tend to do is they look for the brands that they are already familiar with. 
Therefore, this is becoming much more important today for brands to overly um, invest on brand marketing to emerge uh, and have greater visibility and greater results over time. So if we're looking at the different benefits that each type of marketing delivers, and if we're looking at the brand benefits, actually, we're seeing that both brand uh, uh, and activation uh, deliver short-term sales. That's a given. But over time, brand marketing is actually delivering much more, uh, a greater number of benefits, uh, long-term sales and, and pricing power and so on. I will not cover all those benefits today uh, for the sake of uh, remaining uh, within time, but I will invite you to uh, go to b2binstitute.org and, and uh, download the full report. You will have all the details for all those different benefits. So let's concentrate on the first three uh, uh, benefits. So benefit number one, short-term sales. Here, what you need to look into is basically how much value you can generate and the multiplying factor when you are marrying brand with acquisition companies. This is actually an existing uh, case from, from a client who run advertising on LinkedIn. And we realized that by coupling brand activity with acquisition strategy, the conversion rate was increased by a, a factor of 6x. This is pretty big, and this is something to always remember because you're missing out if uh, no branding uh, budgets are actually associated with your acquisition activities. Benefit number two, you all marketers, uh, we all know uh, the very um, uh, standard mental model that is the conversion uh, funnel. Uh, you've got the top of funnel, you've got the bottom of funnel, but I'd like to invite you to flip that funnel, funnel on its side in order to reveal the extent and the importance of the time in that process. If you're looking at the bottom of the funnel, actually that will allow you to target, let's say if we're in the data cloud marketing service uh, industry, uh, maybe you have a potential of 20 clients. This is what we would call the in-market buyers. Um, you know them, uh, you will intend to reach out to them and sell to them. This is known territory. Now, in order to have growth over time, the only way is to grow the number of potential uh, accounts. Uh, here we're talking about 200 accounts. And for that, you need to dramatically increase your uh, branding budgets over a much longer period of time. And this is what we call out of market buyers. Now, the interesting thing about this model is that one will define the current cash flows and the second one will define the future cash flows, which is always key uh, elements to consider when you're talking to your finance people or your CFO, because this will talk to them and this is will this will support your uh, marketing strategy in a very effective way and, 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 and concrete way. Benefit number three, pricing power. Strong brands can actually raise prices. The stronger your brand is, and the more uh, leadway you have on uh, playing on certain key parameters to increase the profit profitability of your brand. Price is one, Sales, volume, fixed costs, variable costs, all of these levers can actually be uh, tweaked around to change and increase your profitability in a meaningful way. So this was the trend number one. Trend number two, blockbuster marketing. Marketing people talk a lot about creativity and they always think about how they can value their creations. Now, there is no better company than Walt Disney to actually look into how creatives are being used to deliver value over time. We think that a company like Walt Disney is a very good benchmark to apply certain principles to the B2B marketing world.
Let me show you what are those different principles that could apply to the B2B marketing, which uh, help Walt Disney be uh, successful the way how they are today. Follow them. One is big bets. I'm not talking about small bets, we're talking about big bets. Number two, all content, all recipes are actually the best ones. This is surprising familiarity. Number three, creativity is actually something that Disney is not uh, working towards so much because they don't want to change the old recipe, the old content so much. So this is what we call consistent distinctiveness. And fourth, we're talking about how you leveraging the content, create merchandising and deliver, distribute via multiple number of media platforms. This is what we call total merchandising. So let's go to the first principle, the big bets. The fundamental idea is that small bets are risky. The bigger your bets are and the more return they will generate. And if we are looking for the biggest blockbusters of the last 20 years, which are listed here, you will notice that actually the smallest investment have delivered the smallest return, whereas the biggest investment have delivered consistently greater return from a ratio of one to six, that much. Second principle, surprising familiarity. If you're looking at the list of all the biggest, highest grossing movies of all time, you will see that the majority of them are actually, again, born out of old content, old recipes. They're all sequels and prequels. This is what works the best. And this is the reason why Hollywood today has shifted towards uh, a sequel model. This is what works the best. And if we're looking at one of the best B2B marketer in the market today, Salesforce, this is exactly what they're doing. With their state of sales report, this is the same recipe over and over again, just different data every year. Friendship principle number three, consistent distinctiveness. If you're looking at the different campaigns of Salesforce, this is the same sort of creativity, the same two-tone blue shade, the same uh, raccoon kid icon, and the same wording. This is the same creative model. If you look at those ads, you know this is Salesforce. It cannot be any other CRM company. Principle number four, total merchandising. The same creative are used across different channels. This is what pays off. And if you're looking at the spread of the revenue of Disney, you can realize very easily that actually not the revenue from movies are the biggest ones, but the one coming from toys. So they are milking uh, the same model and they're leveraging creative and different media platforms to the fullest. And the same way, that's what Salesforce has been doing. Same creative, different channels. That's trend number two. Finally, Trend number three, the death of hyper-targeting. We've all been talking a lot about how to target the best individuals at the right time, at the right place. Well, I'm sorry to say it, but I think this is going to change. In the next decades, this is going to shift. Today, B2B is mostly a niche and a very specific hyper-targeting model, B2C, broader targeting model, but this is gonna change. We believe that over the next 10 years, B2C will target even more broadly than today to accommodate the ever faster changing trends and audiences, whereas B2B will still require some level of targeting, 
but will re require some different type of targeting. Here we're talking about buying category targets. So let's look into it. So we've got different assumptions that we're going to cover, which were actually supporting hyper-targeting model. But let me explain to you why we think those assumptions are actually not valid anymore. Stable buying committee. Well, if you consider all the people involved in the buying process, those individuals are actually moving targets, even more so today. Everybody changes jobs, industries, companies more and more often. So today, the marketing director may have been before an agency director, for example. The current CEO previously was a finance manager. The current IT decision maker was maybe a junior IT person. The latest research that we have uncovered from our member base is that 54%, nothing less than 54% of the LinkedIn members have changed jobs, company, industry, year over year. This is a very fast moving network of people that you still need to target. And so you need to do very broad targeting to capture those individuals. Assumption number two, only buyers matter. Well, they couldn't be any more wrong by assuming the same. Influencers today around the buyers are everywhere. Think about the partners, think about your employees, think about the media, think about the clients. There is a plethora of influencers everywhere and this cannot be ignored. So in the B2C world, they have to target very broadly their category of buyers. This is the very nature of mass marketing. This is how it is. No other way. In the B2B world, what you want to do is actually target 100% of the potential category buyers, nothing less, 100%. Obviously, you don't want to target everyone because in the case of IBM, for example, we know that not everybody will want or will be able to buy IBM, so there is no um, logic in, in targeting a, a broader scope, but you will need to cover 100% of those category buyers. This is where you're going to have the greatest return. Okay. Assumption number three. Here, what you need to understand is basically by doing hyper-targeting, unlike a lot of what a lot of people assume, you're not going to save money. This is not the best strategy for it. There are three types of targeting. There is no targeting at all with uh, uh, lowest CPM level, a very high level of wastage. You have broader targeting level, uh, which is midway. Uh, and you have hyper-targeting, which is the most expensive activity. Actually, the upfront investment for hyper-targeting, this is the very reason why ultimately this is the most costly exercise of all. So broad targeting is the right uh, middle ground to exercise your B2B activity. So these are the three trends that I wanted to present to you. And I would like to finish this demonstration with one slide, which I think is probably very most important graph of the B2B marketing industry today, which is basically the model of the category rich is the single greatest predictor of sales. If you're looking at the difference between share of market and share of voice, if you're growing a brand, you're going to lead the share of markets and you're going to intend to grow as much as possible your share of voice. But here is the catch. If your share of voice is smaller than your share of market, your brand is going to shrink. Now, on the other hand, if your share of voice is actually bigger than your share of market, your brand is going to grow. This is a fundamental 
concept that every marketer in B2B needs to remember. The more clients you have, the more clients you need to acquire to continue growing. This is obvious, but this is the reality today, and this is how marketing needs to be done in B2B. So growth is a function of effective share of voice, which is a difference between the share of voice and the share of market. Food for thought. So how can I apply these trends? Number one, do invest in brand building. This is the only way to deliver future growth. Number two, invest in blockbuster franchises. This is how you're going to deliver value from your creative. Number three, invest in category targeting. If you want to be the leader of your own category, this is the way to go. So hopefully you found this information valuable. Uh, I would like to invite you to uh, visit the b2binstitute.org website where you'll be able to download the full report and all the other 30 trends that were uh, delivered by uh, this think tank. And with that, I will pass the baton to Nawal Aouja, co-founder of Exchange for Media, who's going to moderate the fire chat on the topic of trust-based marketing and post-pandemic recovery. Over to you, Nawal. Good afternoon, and welcome to the first edition of the LinkedIn Exchange for Media India Agency Conclave. I'm here to uh, uh, talk to two gentlemen today, uh, India CEO of Group M, the South Asia CEO of Group M, Prashant Kumar uh, is with me and is uh, Sachin. Sachin Sharma is the India Director for Marketing Solutions for LinkedIn. Thank you gentlemen for joining me. Uh, thank you for taking time out. Uh, the agency world has gone a significant transformation in the last year and a half especially due to the pandemic. And today's conversation is going to be centered around what's happening in the agency, the marketing ecosystem, how media partners are helping clients and agencies uh, reach out customers better. And to curate that conversation, we have these two gentlemen with us who will uh, guide us through what's happening in the agency ecosystem. Let me start with Prashant. Prashant, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Prashant, uh, you know, you took over uh, Group M a uh, little before the pandemic, roughly in 2019 sometime. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, uh, things going on. Uh, even then, the digital world was storming through the media industry, the advertising ecosystem. And the pandemic has just disrupted everything in a very short space of time. Tell us a few things that agencies have gone through in the last 18 months. What's the significant change that has happened? which the pandemic has brought in, which might not have happened otherwise. Yeah, that's a, that's a question which I think for now, people are probably pondering what happened in the last 18 months. Right. <clears throat> I think a lot of things have happened. First of all, this is quite an out of syllabus for everybody. Right. I think every, every leader, every CEO, you know, in 2020, you know, people realize that it's something different. Right? It's quite unique. Right? I think a lot of things have happened. Um, it has happened across consumers, it has happened across the entire landscape, evolving every single week at that time. Right? Uh, it has happened with all of us as people, right? So, with the client, with the partner, with the entire landscape, including our own, ourselves itself, right? Uh, if I were to really look at some of the aspects, I think it's already aware, all of us, that digital acceleration has been at the maximum. We were all probably we were all in the you know, working from home syndrome for a very long time, and that also gave in time, that also gave in bandwidth for people to be curious and try and understand more of the thing. And it will become a big advantage. Right? So, getting information, getting different data, trying on different platforms, content consumption across the platform, all of that came, right? uh, including some of the products, some of the consumer behavior. Right. And that again is through discovery and being curious, including product availability, etc. became and we all witnessed it also. Right. All that became a larger aspect of the issue. Um, I would say that one of the aspects which probably became, became 
more important really from now is not just knowing the consumer but also where do they belong right and what are the cohorts right? segments of them i think uh, if i were to draw in an example uh, if you look at some of the recent campaigns you know one in this day which is about knowing where the customer is not just knowing the customer including the pink code what do they do what are the communities etc it becomes handy in knowing the taste of the consumer and targeting them uh, i think it's also important to know the consumer journey and not just the consumer strategy from there because the journey itself was important that second point right and as we discussed about the acceleration the, the, the technology enablement on that whether it is a cross platform or whether it is products which came in all of that really got embraced in the form of consumer journeys which was uh, a lot of curiosity for all of us and then drawing solutions for the brand requirements and the third aspect um, which came in uh, quite handy and useful is the entire relationship aspect so consumer relation one end, relationship with our clients because they are also part of the same journey they are also going through similar aspects uh one thing that came in handy is the curiosity to learn the platform digital became a universal right it's not just for one expertise that really helped in terms of having different exchanges and all that matters in this this included the relationship with our own employees our own team right because there you got to be in touch with them you got to be connected lots of things happening personally professionally the third aspect is focus on the relationship whether it is on consumer perspective or brand and the consumer or the client practices how it's transforming from their end as well as around us i think we also saw a, a situation where you know what we really uh, embraced more is the new area the new habits the new practices to start from whether it's the area of e-commerce the area of social commerce the area of tech and the products etc that kind of i think they're you know supporting and enabling the human factor because it is uh, consumer the human so are we right from so that aspect developing them skilling them platforms across right to maintain their data more than data insights become more useful and therefore using them and enabling enabling them to gain very very good. and last i would say all of this stood behind a lot of values right i think that is where the aspect of facing the goal uh very courage on attempting to do the solution uh learning and experimenting them uh you know the value aspect of working together because the ecosystem needs to progress with that aspect so these are some of the few learning we had and uh, i think now when we look at and we look behind uh it's a great moment uh i think it was a crash course of how crisis and especially a global crisis in different footprints with different characteristics can be looked at uh, i think it just adds on to the experience of how we look at the crisis and some solutions as well as create complete solutions for the future uh thanks sachin let me just uh, come to you now and tell us uh, you represent the platform side and digital platforms have seen significant growth in the last 18 months the momentum that was already there pre pandemic has taken on to a different level uh and you are at the forefront when it comes to connecting brands with their consumers what are the significant changes you've seen in the last 18 months uh, as a platform uh, the expectations agencies clients have from you and what are those changes which you think are here to stay as yes, first i want to say great context speaker i think the four trends that you covered uh, pretty much sums up what we have seen on the last one year but as a professional platform our vision is to create economic opportunity for the global workforce so you can imagine it's never more relevant or important than in the last one and a half or two years that is entirely what we can focus on and there was a lot of product innovation trusted information insights that we just said that we shared with the workforce so they can adopt to the new norms so there's a, a lot of new launches that we've done for example company tab we have new job titles a ton of launches that have happened over the last two years and then on the platform usage front uh, we can cover this again but massive digital acceleration of what we've seen so we are now 800 million plus members across 200 countries 
and you'll be amazed. But every minute, 130 new members start on the platform. There are 10,000 new connections. Four job types are made every minute of the platform. So massive acceleration there. But I think as a platform, we were very conscious. And again, this is something that we take rooted to is that the values and the background with which we've always served our members, we kept them at the forefront. So factual information was shared with the members. We had to do a lot of product innovation to make the new normal, which is hybrid and remote work, and how people would interact with each other and within the organizations and outside the organizations. So that's been the focus of the last one. In terms of the last bit that PK said is that there's been a massive acceleration, but it's still not back to normal. So I think we are very conscious that we'll continue to innovate and see where this is headed over the next few months. Fantastic. And there's a lot of headroom to go still. Digital has grown significantly, but as you mentioned, there are uh, 30 people coming online on LinkedIn every minute. And there are still many people who are not onto the network yet. So the headroom to go is significant. Pika, let me come back to you and ask you something about you know what's happening as far as the consumer journey is concerned and some of the conversations I've had with uh, you know, uh, brand CEOs over the last 18 months tells me that in many ways, uh, reaching out to consumers has become both easier and difficult. When I say difficult, more complex, right? So can you tell us, because you, you deal with brands across multi uh, uh, sectors, uh, you deal with consumers who are across all media, uh, content, you are also into content curation. In what ways do you think uh, reaching cons customers has become easier? as well as more difficult, so complex. Yeah, it's a good uh, situation to be, I would rather put it, because <clears throat> when the pandemic happened, it came with a lot of challenges. But it also threw in a lot of opportunities, right? And uh, enablement of technology to answer some of the solutions, whether it's reaching consumers or engaging, came with some easy solutions, as well as some complex solutions, right? Uh, a lot of uh, working with platforms, like such a uh, help in collaborative understanding about where the things are going, right? What are, how are the tastes evolving? How do we get to reach them, etc. I think uh, you know the so-called old or uh, you know pre-COVID formula of looking at only compartmental media-wise planning or media-wise thinking moved away and moved into the modern marketing way. Right, on reaching I think this means that accountability, ability to see outcomes and therefore match with that became a primary priority for clients and for clients, right? So platforms really helped in terms of understanding that. And I think the way the plans and the thinking was going on is to see how the reach can be more effective and outcome based and not just from an efficiency. Because the efficiency also meant how wastage can be taken off. Uh, adding that advanced solution that I mentioned earlier is where are the signals, right? And knowing them more, where the technology platform also gave you know solution or opportunities to know them more help. Right? Uh, otherwise, I think it was a pretty much game because as we talk about things, you yourself are part of that. And there were many, many platforms coming in this we have. At that time, whether it's area of distribution, whether it's area of social commerce, or maybe the influence of marketing. Right? When I look at uh, you know, seven, eight years back, and look at all the solutions that we would draw to a client's task, you might probably have about six to seven you know, solutions. That's right. That has probably exploded to some 15, 20 of them. Right? We probably did not have the influence of marketing as one of the key solutions at that time. But now I think brands probably leverage them and will that some of the brands and make it uh, uh, useful for the output that they require. So that again is based in the reach perspective. So looking at reach, whether it's mass or it is very concentrated universe of consumers, that itself became as part of the brief of thinking. That's how the thinking of brief itself works. Right? So this again, I, I would think that the scaling up of some of these products and you know, solutions is happening as we speak. I think somewhere this itself will evolve, right? I would I would also feel some of the emergence of newer solutions that can come out of it. You, you touched base on the content perspective. I think the entire advancement on how content should be looked at from communications perspective in itself is an evolution of space. 
uh, a lot more personalization, a lot more ability to at the same time, real time ways to talk to different consumers, technology emerge, which again is bringing the engagement of the consumer much more effective. So all of this is actually a very exciting space, right? Uh, some of them actually for all of us, and when you look at more and more, is applicable to our own organization because our own employees are in a way trying to learn most of this. So it's a great learn. Um, I think a lot of our learning and unlocking value for brands are coming through many of these new uh, modern marketing approaches. Fantastic. I'm going to come back to this learning unlearning bit uh, a little later. Let me jump back to Sachin now. Sachin, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, you are at the forefront of you know, what's happening with consumers. Digital has had significant uptick because of pandemic, but it's also made a life very uh, challenging and complex for digital platforms per se. Uh, there is fragmentation. There are multiple platforms where consumers have to spend time. So uh, keeping the engagement going and making sure that you're relevant because in the digital world, you're only as relevant as you know yesterday morning. So how do you make sure that your relevance and the engagement keeps going up when uh, every day there are you know newer and newer platforms? Merge? Absolutely. So back in 2020, when the impact and scale of the pandemic became apparent, the first thing we realized is that our members were actually flocking to trusted sources of information. And so both content creation and content sharing spiked massively, which is also something that PK covered, is the digital acceleration piece across platforms and across social primarily. Now, one of our strengths always has been that we've taken a members first approach. And we've also been globally the most trusted platform for the last six years. So, so there was a lot of goodness that we could share with the members. But yes, we had to do some product innovation. We had to figure out ways of how we can scalably share trusted information with them that they could rely on. So that is what we solved for. Also, coming back to one of the points that we get is very, very interesting in front of influencer marketing. So you would see that the new influencers from a professional perspective that we won more than over the last few years. Uh, and that has happened globally, not just in India. So that's the other bit of acceleration that we've got. Some members could get access to the information that they were looking for. But just to give you an idea, we've seen about 29% year over year both in public content sharing on the platform. And it has not been easy because as the members and as our customers were going through the pandemic, this painful journey, we tried to partner with them. But like PK said, internally, our own teams were going through the same journey. And it was just so chaotic. It was very difficult. To have the agility to innovate on the fly and to build products and services that cater to our members. So, so it has been a great learning experience for sure. One of the things I really like about the PK set is the partnership that say a group M agencies have had with networks. And the idea for that was to share factual, trustworthy information and use relevant insights to cater to not just our consumers but also to brands. And one of the things about this pandemic and a lot of research has gone into this is as brands look at emerging from this cycle, from this economic cycle, partnerships and trusted partnerships are going to be very important, which brings in the element of trust. And what we've realized is 70% of purchase decisions by the consumers is actually linked to the trust that they have. In fact, there's a great recent Harvard study that's been published. Two key drivers of trust that we've realized is one's competence, so both technical competence and social, the environment that you're operating, how well you innovate. And the other is ethics. And a lot of communication, a lot of our partnership with Group M, for example, has been about how do we help brands be open and communicate the values, their culture, and their work modalities and operations to build that trust with the audience as they try and look at economic recovery. So, from a consumer perspective, yes, massive acceleration to answer your question, but we've had to innovate in parallel, and we are still obviously grappling with a lot of problems that this industry is facing. But also on the brand side, on the marketing side, great partnerships, the data that we have access to, all of us has been dedicated to some of their needs. A yeah, very important point, Sachin, you mentioned there, and I think the pandemic has kind of uh, opened a complete Pandora's box. I recall during uh, last year, the first lockdown, there was so much news floating around, and uh, one would typically bank upon credible, trustworthy, reliable sources of information uh, for any news about how the pandemic was spreading and digital platforms because of the way uh, we mushroomed in the last few years i think uh, 
trust and credibility has become a very very important aspect which kind of segregates the you know reliable platforms versus the others and a lot of brand you work with brands across so many sectors they are also extremely uh, you know conscious of the fact that they need to be present on you know platforms that are credible and that are trustworthy what's your uh, uh, you know experience with clients when it comes to uh, uh, working with platforms uh, which have trust and credibility and i ask this question for a reason is that you know there is a saying uh, always you know in content and journalism any news is good news right uh, but at the same time when you uh, when you're looking at news which might not be true fake news has become such a you know uh, big menace online these days on one hand brands are seeking reach higher engagement on the other side you also don't want to associate with something which is kind of not trustworthy so it's a very thin line you walk how do you make sure that you continue to walk the thin line without falling on your side i think uh, as we all discussed uh, it's not i mean during the pandemic is not this issue is not just a pandemic issue that's right this has always existed <clears throat> i think you know, trust and integrity is a lot now the value that drives any content and also enables ambience for brands to communicate with us uh you know uh, what probably we witnessed is because we were spending a lot of time with ourselves with the families at home and probably there was a lot of consumption of content starting from our children to our parents and our grandparents and they had all different platforms from digital platforms tv newspaper radio multiple aspects and of course it was not an easy context because the pandemic itself was not a very challenging one and we have seen how different countries have started using that for their own you know, progress in dealing with the pandemic in different forms from digital platforms content etc that too happened during this time when you look at our clients i think uh, every single client today uh, has only got more educated from all these happenings right and educated because they themselves got involved as a consumer as well as a practitioner now that enabled us to study this and talk to them and discuss and co create what are some of the good really purposeful aspects for any campaign which should happen so first first many of the first uh, which we look at is observing learning them right formulating some benchmarks understanding what is it talking to platforms talking to partners aligning with them on some of the principles that we should look at talking back to the clients understanding what is this and therefore leading with it and they were collectively trying to build the trusted marketplace for the entire ecosystem so client value is a very primary form i can say today that more partners and existing partners also value this in a very progressive manner i think all this enables us to have right conversations right solutions and bring in that aspect of trust and integrity into the solution And we are seeing this progressing very well. Uh, benchmarks are very useful. Many of the tools are very useful. Many of the data insights which partners provide, just as Nitin and Sachin mentioned, they become useful when you go to discussion with clients. So I think it's a progressive space. Uh, but yeah, the ambience is something which I think every content owner will also look at how it can value back to the consumer first, and then how it can be leveraged for brands to come. Yes, uh, especially since uh, uh, most of the brands aspire to be brands of meaning, brands of purpose. I think uh, being on platforms where brand safety is ensured has become even more important. I will take this question to Sachin uh, with a slightly different view, Sachin. And again, you work with a large number of agency partners and brands. In your sense, what is the importance brands are now increasingly attaching to things like brand safety, credibility of data? you know ad fraud ad fraud has been a conversation we've been having for the last few years digital has grown significantly in the last few years and you know uh, increasingly more and more brands are investing money on digital viewability measurement uh, measurability uh, what's your sense of what is the kind of conversations uh, importance that brands are now giving to these conversations so now the interesting point is because of the digital acceleration that we've seen over the last one and a half two years i love that thing which is that it's all family members now consuming information and data at an increased pace 
And because of that, there's been a lot more focus. But these suddenly reissues predate the pandemic itself. So, that's right. right. And so we've uh, we've always at LinkedIn we've had a members first approach, and that means every decision we make, every product feature, innovation that we do, and when we have to make trade offs, most importantly, we always keep members as our most important priority. So that hasn't changed. And in partnership with agencies, and I know a lot of cutting edge work has actually happened in Group M in terms of KC, in terms of trust. We, some of these partners bring that insight and knowledge to us. Uh, but one of the principles that we are driven now is uh, privacy by design, which means everything that we design, every new feature we roll out, we have to be conscious and respectful of the fact that we sit on a massive heap of first party data that these members have willfully shared with us. Right. So, for example, if you look at LinkedIn as a platform, people are building these profiles and giving out this information, and therefore the responsibility or accountability to use this. Yes. But yes, we've seen a lot more interest, and that's the direction you will see us going in. Uh, the other great point that we feel is what is trusted marketplace concept. And what I would like to underline there is the importance of doing this collaboratively with partners across the ecosystem. So it's not just platform platform that's probably going to solve this. One is it's an ongoing journey and uh, all of our innovation, all of our thinking, we are collaborating very actively with, with partners, with third parties. We are trying to bring in the stakeholders to try and see eventually what does the final outcome look like, but with our members as the core focus area. So how do we solve for their privacy has been top of mind and LinkedIn forever. I think we have a slightly advantageous position because of the access to the first party data um, as more privacy related regulations come into effect. Uh, and some of these industry changes take effect over the next few years. Uh, but I think that's one of the other reasons that there is a lot more thought introspection at LinkedIn of how we want to use that. Uh, but yes, we are going to partner with the agencies. You will see a lot more focus on this. And I think eventually this landscape will evolve over the next few years. Yes, and very interesting uh, things have come out, like PK said, uh, you know, pre pandemic, we had, you know, so called compartmentalization. Uh, this would be your sources for news, these would be your sources for entertainment, this for sports, uh, this for non-fiction. Now that sort of compartments are gone, almost every platform has become source for information, almost every platform is source for entertainment. Uh, so, you know, if you're consuming so much news from so many platforms across the board, brand safety, the credibility of the platforms is also very uh, become extremely important. Let me come now to the post-pandemic world as we come out of uh, you know, COVID and hopefully uh, the worst is behind us. Uh, uh, we've seen, PK, you've uh, done a bit of restructuring as well as created sort of new verticals within your company. Uh, we saw a news few days back, you, uh, you created something called Group M Services, you've appointed somebody in charge, you've doubled down on, you know, content curation, uh, what you're doing with clients in that area. Can you tell us a few, give us a glimpse of what's happening across various verticals in Group M? And as you come out of the pandemic, how you're restructuring and how are you looking at the post-pandemic world in terms of, you know, how uh, an agency ecosystem will be structured uh, for, you know, the client? I think, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I can still say post-pandemic, though I would like to happily mention that. But yeah, we are there, right? Um, I think for us, everything is in the area of driving benefits to our clients, right? And partners. Right. It's, a, it's an ecosystem and since we are fortunate and blessed to be a leader in the market, I think there's a lot of responsibility to ensure that we look at it in that context. Uh, during this last you know, 18 months, and this is not something, you know, I can't say that we didn't plan any of this or we didn't have any of it in mind, but I think just like a lot of, lot of things were accelerated, this is also an opportunity to look at how we can be more effective, how we can have specialism and leverage that, how we can contribute to newer radical solutions like commerce, data, insights, technology, as well as how we can collaboratively bring all the solutions back to our clients as well as work with partners. You are right, uh, specialism is an important word here because I, I genuinely feel that uh, there's only one expert, the, the expertise, I mean, as much as we expertise on specialism, you have to do that. There's only one way to do it, right? Uh, playing a cover drive is uh, it's like you have to have a, one way of playing a cover drive, right? Of course, hitting a six, you can do multiple ways. So this is not hitting a six because hitting a six is 
in a different way to look at them and all uh, when look at platform expertise we need to focus there more so how can we create more experts in different areas how can we have you know different story aspects on thinking and strategy etc as well as how can we drive benefits for clients and therefore work along with our partners became the core of how we do this while all of this is happening i think we should also embrace the point that transformation and growth go hand in hand there is transformation happening in the consumer side in the client side and that is actually we can also transform and growth is also going to happen because all of us are how we can progress so what are some of the areas where we can you know bring in more specialism where we can consolidate bring in more benefits what are some of the areas where your, your new tools and new ways of working can be looked at all of this started up like so we therefore came with a you know, point of services one of the areas which we focused and brought in more expertise specialism and working across uh, some of the services some of the products we launched right uh, looking at the technology aspect as now i mentioned on the content aspect so going beyond some of the only short format or long format and focusing more on platform related you know video customization all of that stuff but i must say that when we try to do all of this it's important to bring it together everybody right so as such in mention working with partners enable working with other partners in some of the areas enable the thinking to go even sharper and more stretched so drive benefits are to your clients become very very critical and very good to do that right so we see a, a situation going forward for us where transformation growth go ahead in time right and therefore it is a necessity to keep the relevance of transformation learn from it observe as well as apply it back into areas of growth and that is where you see a lot of people coming together applying the technology aspect enable them because i think as technology enable human from that context wherever effectiveness and efficiency can be obtained i think that's what everybody is focusing on which applies to our own industry and we see that a uh, very progressive journey so far and a lot of exciting aspects coming in so many co-created products with different platforms uh, so much of insights which can be looked at and real time aspects can be looked at so i think all this new way of working is uh, making the excitement even more so let me come to some softer aspects of you know what's happened during the pandemic and as we come out of it what's likely to happen uh, pk uh, as i uh, mentioned at the beginning you took over uh, in 2019 before the pandemic what's been the toughest parts of you know being a leader in these last two years um frankly uh the, there have been times where you talk uh things are good right? and uh, sometimes during this pandemic time you know i believe that we are all social animals and sometimes we feel a bit more lonely but that to me is the most of it so uh, definitely i have my own ways of doing it uh, those are some of the new discoveries so you speak to colleagues you speak to friends close maybe your family I do have a pet. So I spend some time with my pet. All of that is important for all of us to sustain and drive ourselves out of this so-called crisis, which we never knew. Probably, you know, from any of our parents or our grandparents. Right? So that's very important. So loneliness, how to get over it. Uh, but I must say that uh, you know it's important and uh, to recognize first and accept that there is a challenge, right? Because by doing that you open yourself to trying many multiple things and also bring your you know origin genuine values up to your reach right so for for me collective team became extremely important because this organization is a collective research of multiple talent multiple leader who really bring brought in the journey of progress every month every year I think I, the sense of gratitude is very much in on the bottom of my heart to all the people who advised me, organizers, as well all the people who helped. So my colleagues, including my bosses, including some of the partners, including many of the clients who were part of it. So the advisors are very key. And the moment you realize this, because you got to exchange some of this, because that gives an idea for somebody to jab and come with solution. Uh, I would also say that. Uh, you know 
as this pandemic had a mixture of many challenging personal and professional across different people, let us not get distracted by something which I probably think, right? While emotionally we are connected to it and there full 24 hours, 365 days in that context, we should not get distracted because the moment you get, it could be an issue that is threatening you or do something else. But if you dis- get distracted, then you lose the focus on what you're trying to do for the organization, for your people, and therefore to a client, and therefore to a partner. So that's, that's very, very good. I think um, a lot of it has been a good uh, experience, right? Though I must say that a lot of it also included things which we never wanted, right? But bringing, you know, a lot of things, gems within ourselves, uh, within our teams, were a great discovery, you know? Uh, of course, there are also some disappointments which happened, but I'm sure. But gems, discovering them, discovering the solution, etc., became extremely, you know, uh, useful and encouraging. So, the, so well, there's more, but I think these are some of the key elements uh, which I really felt, uh, you know, in this, in this journey and uh, inspiring each other, uh, uh, you know, a collective influence, uh, you know, being transparent and honest to what is happening. All that helped to carry a lot of people to a direction which uh, we can do more and, and be progressive. Yes, Sachin, you uh, lead a fairly large team again uh, uh, as marketing solutions at LinkedIn. While on one hand, you know, a pandemic has delivered significant growth to the business, but the human, the people aspects have been very difficult and very challenging last 18 months. A lot of us have gone through personal tragedies while trying to uh, you know, keep focus on what's happening at work. What's your leadership style? How have you dealt with it personally as the team of the leader? I would actually break this into two parts. And I think one part which is our team event, which is your leadership, with the internal constituencies, which is your team, your partners, uh, people that you interact with and work with every day. So a lot of gratitude for this fact that we have very progressive leadership at LinkedIn. And it was very easy transition for us because typically we've worked from the starting point of culture of trust in our employees. So you would have seen some of these messages come out. But we went into a complete remote and hybrid work model and we continue to use that model. And of course, we've seen the results only get stronger over the last one year. So one aspect of this was with the teams internally. Uh, and I think what we're seeing right now globally is probably one of the biggest changes to it. The world of work, which is people are not just questioning where and how they work, they're questioning why they work in the first place, and therefore the massive resignation drive and the flight of talent. But we at LinkedIn believe we call it the great reshuffle, and we believe that this will eventually have very beneficial impact to the world of work and to the overall ecosystem. So we believe leaders have to lead with inclusion, with empathy, and you have to innovate on the fly. You have to really see what's working for your teams. That's exactly what we've done for the last one and a half years. Um, I also know that it's been very surprising for some because people were not initially convinced that the business would continue to do as well in the new setting with the remote and hybrid environment become so mainstream. Uh, and it's very convincing and also promising to see that really the business hasn't suffered at all. Right? In fact, our, our employees, our teams, much more in the state of mental well-being, are able to contribute their best. And so we're taking a very gradual, very paced out approach to how we want to get back to the normal. And what the new normal looks like, of course, is something we're trying to define. So that's internal. And then I think the other aspect of this is with the brands, with the marketers, and how we educate them. We spoke a little bit about this earlier, but brands need to have a voice. And how are you interacting with your customers and giving them solutions? Are you actually solving their problems as you emerge out of the family? That's the other aspect of this. Um, but one thing I would I would definitely say to cap this off, I don't know if we are at the end of the pandemic, I really do hope so. But it was a humanitarian crisis, it was big, it was impactful, it hit home, close to the families, to the teams, um, but it has definitely opened our eyes about what's possible and how you can delegate and give more authority to people to figure out what progression and careers look like for them. Very well said Sachin, and one of the, I think, important aspects uh, that pandemic has brought about is the value of empathy and compassion and the fact that businesses exist not just to make profit but to contribute to society 
to make sure society members are taken care of. Sachin, I'll let you have the last word. Tell us what's in store for us from LinkedIn next few years. What are the, going to be the focus areas, uh, new products, solutions uh, that you are uh, looking to introduce? Uh, we are very excited about the future. Uh, number one, as you know, I think has covered this uh, multiple times in this conversation. That it's going to be more of digital acceleration. So you will definitely see a lot of features around how employees can work in a remote or hybrid environment, but still get the experience that you would get face to face. Uh, we've launched many new features like mm -hmm. virtual events. We've done a lot of innovation on our ad side, and that will continue to happen. Uh, while obviously looking at the privacy principles, but how do we share more information in terms of measurement? terms of attribution. So some of those features are going to come up next. I think the last bit that I would say is that we are also seeing massive interest in learning and upskilling on the platform. So millions of people are signing up for courses. And so as we get to the end of this conversation, I would like to just reinforce what Pika just said is there isn't an opportune time or there isn't the best course that you should be taking. It is just a concept of can you learn a new any new concept or go back and revisit the concept. So I think that is going to be very, very important for LinkedIn because working professionals, right, they're now in a new environment. There are so many more opportunities. So obviously everyone wants to reskill and upskill. But that shouldn't come with any sense of pressure. That's right. So so that's what we're looking forward to. And you're starting to see a lot of new features in the innovation. Personally, last one and a half years, I've spent a lot of time with my seven-year-old daughter and I got to revisit Hindi Lakshar. So I finally realized that this, there is still time for me to learn something that I was never able to learn. So, so that's, that's the positive note for you. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, like a lot of people say, the important thing in life as in business is to continue to make mistakes. That's the only way to grow. Uh, you should be worried if you're not making mistakes. Doing is most important, getting out and doing it. Uh, get an opportunity to meet you in person and this is an on-ground initiative. Thank you, PK. Thank you, Sachin, Thank you. for uh, spending time. Uh, you're free to shoot your questions to us and we'll take them to PK and Sachin. Till then, goodbye and I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, thank you so much, Naval, and uh, thank you, PK and, and uh, Sachin for taking our time. I think we are here and uh, over to you, Manoj, for the most interesting panel we've been waiting for. Thank you so much, Santosh. Uh, that is a, indeed a very interesting discussion. Uh, hey, everyone, and welcome to this uh, panel discussion. Um, today, we're going to have... Uh, hopefully a very interesting conversation with some uh, veterans from the uh, the agency space uh, in India. So if I could request uh, Bharat, Chami and Aditi uh, to switch on their video so that we can kick off with uh, with introduction. Hey Chami, hello Aditi, hey Bharat. Hi guys. Welcome to this uh, panel discussion. I think uh, we will we'll let Vinod join whenever he can. Uh, but uh, to kick it off, I really just wanted to start by uh, introducing all of you and uh, just uh, looking at all your uh, profiles. And I think, uh, hey, hey Vinod, welcome. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So I was just saying that I was looking at all your profiles, and uh, between all of you, you guys have probably a century or more of uh, experience in the uh, agency space in India. So, uh, you know, across industries, brands, verticals of all shapes and sizes. And obviously you've seen the, the uh, media industry in India evolve. So uh, hopefully, you know, uh, we'll get some very interesting insights from all of you. Uh, so I think uh, to, to sort of, I just want to make sure I uh, introduce all of you to the audience. So uh, probably start with Chani. Uh, so Chani, you've uh, founded Connect about uh, 10, 10 to 12 years ago. And this is obviously most recently uh, partly acquired by IPG. So you're part of the IPG group now and uh, obviously work with some wonderful brands. So uh, many congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, uh, Vinod, who's been a, uh, again, a veteran who's been with uh, Group M in, in multiple roles across, in, in sort of the WVP group in uh, multiple agencies there across uh, uh, multiple roles. But, uh, you know, most, uh, most recently has uh, moved to the, the the CDO role uh, at uh, at Densu and is also the uh, CEO of uh, of High Prospect. So, uh, Vinod, congratulations on your new dual role, and and welcome to the, to the panel. Um, and Bharat uh, again, who, who spent a lot of time with the WP group, mainly with with Saxes, uh, building it up from from grounds up. 
for several years and again uh, very recently has uh, moved to a new role uh, the chief digital officer apac for the omnicom group so congratulations on your new role again bharat uh, thanks and aditi uh, obviously you've been with uh, with the load star sort of group for for a while now and uh, and currently are in the chief strategy officer role and obviously you you've done a lot of work working with several brands devising you know and 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 uh, deploying product strategy and you know brand strategies uh, across various industries so welcome to the panel aditi as well um, so, uh, just to just to kick off uh, i thought i'll go around and just uh, get a sense from all of you as to how you've seen the uh, client agency sort of relationship evolve uh, in india particularly over the last you know 5 years or so because there's so much has changed obviously you know digital has become more important content has become more important so i just wanted to see from each one of your lenses uh, through the agencies that that all of you have led and uh, the various brands you worked at what are like maybe a couple of key changes that that you observed so maybe aditi we can start with you sure so um i think in the last 5 years what has fundamentally changed uh, in the agency client relationship is uh, an increased desire for accountability so uh, you know everybody is looking at agency partners to be accountable more from a business partnership lens rather than just the deliverables uh, that they had in terms of media or in terms of uh, pricing or in terms of content so uh, now clients are looking at agency partners to partner their journey with full accountability and that has obviously changed the relationship because in some ways it has become extremely strategic because you are actually a, a, a much uh, bigger part of the business planning that you uh, you know now are contributing to versus perhaps what you were doing earlier but at the same time because of the increased pressures of business there is a big roi focus so it's uh, i think a, a dual uh, kind of a challenge which uh, agencies need to now work with clients as so man i do think that has made uh, life easier or more difficult for agencies as a result i think it's made life interesting uh, because uh, it also has forced all agencies to look within uh, everybody has to now design teams which understand complete journeys they need to not just look at you know one siloed piece of the pie but see how everything is coming together and uh, that has helped i think agencies also figure out what are the areas they need to invest in what are the kind of people the talent the tools uh, you know data is the big buzzword now where all should we go as partners and where all should we be focusing on to make sure that we do can uh, do the best for our clients i would say makes sense makes sense thanks aditi you know your perspective on this yeah i guess uh, uh initially like you asked uh, manoj i guess uh, what has changed i think it's make it made the relationship much much more stronger uh the client agency are no more vendors or an agency i guess now clients understand that we are more partners in business uh the clients work with agencies obviously uh because they know that these are the agencies who also have skin in the game uh and uh, in the last 2 years i guess uh, uh like i think aditi mentioned uh, so rightly articulated like it has become interesting but at the same time more accountable right uh, uh the clients and the agencies work together and i have seen uh, in uh, boardrooms working together putting the entire business plans uh, uh while we understood that initially on covid uh, there was no playbooks there was nothing which was ready uh, but people have evolved people have taken that uh, into their stride and uh, currently i think businesses have opened clients are happy spending uh, consumers especially on on uh, digital have grown exponentially and we need to see all reports which are there in the market where is the next 500 700 million coming from i guess agencies and clients uh, understand this that it's together that we need to uh, make sure that we evolve this medium to another level do you see it moving more from a transactional relationship to like a true partnership where there is more skin in the game for agencies as well is that is that i guess it's it's already a partnership i won't say it's transactional anymore because uh, if you see that when we discuss business objectives and not only advertising or media 
I would want to believe that it's going to be a partnership and not, not a, a relationship where, okay, you need to just execute my campaigns. It's much more strategic in nature. And yeah. uh, uh, because if you're relying on your client as well as the client is relying, relying on the agency uh, to make sure that we together achieve those business objectives, I guess it's, it's an integrated partnership together. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, you know. Uh, Chami, and uh, again, I know that you're not sort of uh, an independent agency in that sense anymore, but given your journey as an independent agency, uh, is there a, a special uh, lens you have in terms of how the relationship uh, has evolved with clients? Yeah, so <clears throat> when what's happened for us is that initially when we started off, digital was just an amplification medium. You know, the mainline agencies would be cracking the creative communication. And digital was just supposed to be um, just uploading those pieces on YouTube, Facebook, and that's really the role that they were playing. Um, now, what has happened is, especially after the pandemic, what has happened is digital has come into the forefront and how, you know, the kind of contribution that a digital agency is having in a business um, uh, or a CEO and a CMO's life has only changed. I think most CMOs now uh, have a KPI of as to how much uh, what is the spend that they're doing on digital? How are they innovating on digital? In fact, some CMOs have said that, please teach us how it's done because we need to kind of make sure that we have our jobs in place. So what I'm saying is that it's it's really become a conversation in uh, boards, in the CEO tables and the CMO tables. And digital has really come into the forefront from that standpoint. So the relationship has become far more integrated than before. Um, I'll tell you, for example, like a lot of the marketing signals are now coming from digital. You know, when we're launching brands also, they're like, a digital launch, karte. let's see how it goes. You know, if this market is, if it's, it's getting the right kind of uh, reception, then let's go out there and launch the product in, you know, the XYZ cities. So a lot of marketing signals are coming from, from, from digital from that standpoint and therefore, you know, contributing to the business. So I just feel like also digital is evolving really fast. So what's happening, it's, it's not, um, you know, so agencies are becoming more critical because it's very difficult for the client side teams to keep up with the pace at which, you know, things are moving. So therefore, I feel like, forget transactional it's now very very strategic and you know far more integrated than before yeah i suppose what you're saying is that given that digital skills are have become hard to keep up with yeah. uh, you know agencies and the ecosystem that has that uh, you know we'll see brands and clients or are, are you already seeing brands and clients become more dependent on them for those skills because it's hard for them to to build yeah. that those skills yeah, at scale, right? yeah exactly exactly yeah. it's not that they aren't i mean yeah. they, but I mean, if they want to go deeper and, you know, grow faster then you know, the agency dependency has definitely gone up from that standpoint. Would you say that's true of uh, some of the new age digital only brands as well, sort of who, who've come out of digital, even do you think there, uh, that dynamic is at play? No, that's not the case. In, in, in those clients, I mean, they largely have their own digital teams okay. where, you know, especially important services like performance marketing and all is kept in-house. But a lot of, you know, uh, traditional businesses like brick and mortar companies, for them, this is a little bit of a journey. Yeah. So for them, their dependencies on agencies like us is pretty high. Yeah. Makes sense. Thanks, Chandni. Uh, Bharat, I would love uh, your perspective, especially from a, a more of a, you know, how, how are brands now or, or clients when they're dealing with agencies looking at, uh, you know, especially measurement, right? Given your, your background with Zaxis, uh, is, is that changing or has that changed a lot? Uh, definitely. I think uh, most of the brands are right now, I would say, in between the two worlds of digital. Uh, one which exists right now and one which is there uh, coming in next few months. And uh, more or less, I think uh, in my recent experience with all the global brands, regional brands, I think the first thing uh, which they asked me in my new role is that how can you handhold us uh, into the new Web 3.0 journey and uh, what are the disruptions happening? So more or less, I think brands are now bringing a lot of accountability and trust on the agency side uh, to give them uh, a vision and the future prospective approach that uh, from a measurement sense, uh, how these clean rooms will going to play, what is the role of uh, cookie and identity depreciation, how is going to impact their business. Uh, some of the brands are quite interestingly, I would say, 
uh, taking a leap faith and uh, moving very fast. Uh, example, some brands are already doing what you say, uh, the new uh, conversion API pixel from Facebook so that they're still able to track the convergence at this stage and do a A-B testing before things go out on that way for India as a market. And most of the brands are also, I think, relying and trusting agencies to bring certain type of a knowledge uh, from different geographies. So considering most of the holding companies manage brands uh, globally, regionally. So I think there is a lot of learnings which we get from other markets where we have already seen an impact, like of a US or a China. And uh, similarly, I think measurement is again becoming a quite uh, critical element, not just for digital, but I think the overall holistic media measurement, because some of the old school uh, uh, media mix modeling is currently now being outdated. And uh, again, now digital bringing more solid walls uh, not allowing brands to actually export any sort of data is bringing more challenges around uh, what is the future of measurement. So there are ways in which brands are now thinking about how to use certain tools which actually give predictive modeling type of approach uh, so that they can predict the customer churn ratio or any lifetime value. Uh, plus, I think there are frameworks in which uh, as agency groups are working with uh, the big giants uh, to create some sort of proprietary technology so that the brands can start exploring these technologies at an early stage and uh, become a clear winner uh, in the measurement game. Makes sense, makes sense, Bharat. Thanks for that. Um, so I'd like to just uh, double click a little bit on the, the branding uh, or brand building part of it in particular, right? Uh, and I think more in the context of what's happened in the last you know, 18 to 24 months without mentioning the the big C uh, or the big P as, as we call it. Uh, but you know, how has that, shaped how how brands are uh, or how you know uh, companies are approaching uh, building brands like is 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 um, is 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 sort of the full funnel approach gaining more traction or are, are brands seeing the value of or are companies seeing the value of uh, you know branding leading to demand gen like you know as as a more natural consequence uh, rather than you know the curse of digital which has been like measurability and hence we will only uh, spend on what we get immediate value for. So just in that context and in the context of what's happened in the last two years, would love each one of your thoughts. And, and if there are examples of, of brands who have done some clutter breaking work that, that you could quote or share, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. So um, Aditi, what are your thoughts on that? So uh, interesting question, as you know, obviously uh, the last 18 months has transformed everybody. So, yeah. uh, both as uh, you know as companies as people as consumers everything has changed and uh, one of the big things i think which has impacted brands is this whole need to be much more authentic in their communication mm -hmm. much more real uh, in terms of you know what they are going out to the consumers with and uh, in a sense uh, you know it, it is almost become like authentic stories but faster told because uh, at the consumer end, what has happened is everybody is looking at uh, convenience and speed and uh, the traditional journeys. And it's very different across categories, uh, you know, like Chani mentioned, when we talk about traditional players uh, and how people may be buying things at retail versus an online player, the, uh, the whole world has in a way merged for a lot of consumers. You know, what you could buy online, you also can buy offline and people are moving very fast. And for brands to service them or to reach out to them, their messaging, their communication also has to uh, pan both these worlds. So that is one big change, I think, that we are seeing in a lot of clients. So uh, while for the same client, on one hand, you are going the precision path and, you know, you are deep diving into a lot of data like Bharat was talking about. But at the same time, you need to tell, tell a story which is compelling because that part of the world and how a consumer buys a brand has not gone away. And that is putting pressure on the system, both in terms of, you know, where brands should focus and how they should, uh, I would say, deploy their uh, monies, because both of them need their own uh, investments and uh, the fact that you need to do it over a period of time. So uh, that is one challenge that we are seeing, uh, I would say, across brands. Uh, the other difference which has happened is that while everybody has become, uh, you know, a lot more digitally savvy than they were before. But the experience that people get is quite different. So, you know, we can design wonderful creatives, but how it is delivered to a person in a Mumbai or a Delhi is quite different from what a person in Bhilwara sees, for example. Both because of the device that they have, 
the connectivity or the bandwidth that they have and the language that they consume the content in and that again is something which is putting the pressure back on brands saying how do you straddle these two worlds together but at the same time create meaningful connections so uh, that is what we have been seeing i think in the last 18 months there are brands which have been successful uh, i would say especially if we look at brands in the cpg space uh, uh, which are dealing with essentials i think they have had a good run for multiple reasons but at the same time when you look at brands that we work on which are in the travel or the lifestyle category uh, those are obviously being challenged because of business reasons interestingly there are other categories which have picked up uh, you know like payments or uh, maybe in auto ev which has come uh, you know a long way suddenly because everybody has become very conscious about what is their impact on the world and uh, with covid impacting uh, livelihood uh, you know everybody is reviewing their financials and where should they be investing their money as consumers you know so there are trade offs to be made and uh, this is one place i think where people are seeing a trade off so uh, that's i think in a broad view uh, the changes that the last 18 months have brought in our lives and i would say more in the lives of brands yeah absolutely uh, makes sense uh, aditi uh, we know just picking on from what aditi said a hey, your perspective on what has happened in the last 18 24 months but then also as aditi talked about you know uh, bangalore versus bilwada uh, you know obviously the audiences in each of these places have uh, eight different aspirations uh, also but more importantly different value to a brand right i mean uh, the eventually it's it's what what they value a particular consumer in in a location as but then they also have to build a, a universal brand lot of the you know let's say retail or even you know uh, financial services uh, brand so what are your thoughts and or what have you heard and seen from from brands yeah so manoj i'll break this up into two i yeah. guess it's a long uh, question but uh, let's take the first part which you asked about in the last 18 months to 24 months how is branding and how are brands developing right on digital i guess uh, what exactly uh, spoke about in the last one right uh, it's all about uh, uh, you know making sure what your client objectives are and mm-hmm. i'll i'll dwell upon this what i mean uh gone are the days in digital where we used to talk about uh there is a branding and there is a performance i think it's a very thin line which divides the both anymore it's uh i was in one of the uh boardrooms and uh, it was very nicely articulated by the cmo himself he said what i need from you is uh what would be my growth plan now you could you could definitely say whether uh depending on categories to categories right uh, it could be uh, an fmcg versus an oem versus uh, auto manufacturer and and things like that it depends on what your core kpis are and hence the 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 digital planning or strat uh, like we say would be based on that so uh some cases could be heavily inclined towards uh the top of the funnel which we talk about brand and then uh getting into e-commerce and hence getting into performance as well in certain cases when we are talking about uh pure play transactions pure play downloads it could be performance but then we have seen uh some of the d2 d2 c companies which started with digital performance have now gone back and doing traditional advertising so like i said it's a very very thin line as to how you divide uh branding and performance between both i guess uh it only depends on objectives of the client what we are wanting to deliver for that year for the client and so on and so forth seeing the changes in digital uh seeing how measurable digital is getting and bharat spoke about it uh in this earlier section uh i guess more and more brands are looking at digital investments uh the media share changing from uh you know traditional to digital very soon uh i would now try to focus on the second part of the question uh, manoj would you spoke about different audiences looking at advertising communications differently uh, we know that the next 500 700 million would come from the so called bharat which we talk about right which is your tier 2 tier 3 and hence communication hence devising a strategy for them is that much more critical and in the last uh, one and a half two years we've seen platforms uh coming up to address only those requirements so as a client as a partner agency i think what we also recommend is there should be a mix 
depending on what your audience is actually consuming. So, uh, and today we can actually talk about audience targeting thank, thanks to the kind of latest technology which digital has bought, thanks to you know uh, the kind of uh, trustworthiness on brands, on content. There are very, very uh, measurements which are coming out on brand safety and other things. I guess it's that much more critical when we are talking to a tier two, tier three audience to talk to them in their language, which they understand the most. And you will see far degree of maybe a brand salience or performance, depending again on the objective of the client. I guess it's, it's category to category, but I completely agree that in your media mix, you should, like we always used to say, the three V's, right? The video, the vernacular and the voice. You need to understand how do you interplay between them depending on where your target audience is at the moment. So if your target audience is tier two, tier three, and we know for sure that because of the kind of networks bandwidth, because of the kind of handsets they have, is it better to do vernacular and voice for them? Depending on the metro audiences, is it yet better to continue with English or they say language targeting, depending on where they originate from and videos for, for the metro audiences. So it's how you want to target your audiences depending on the markets and the TG the clients has. I, I hope I've answered the question. Sorry for the lengthy answer, but. No, absolutely, Vinod. I was just curious, Vinod. So when you, when you think about uh, tier two, tier three, what's the main change that brands have to look at? Is it more just the content and the language or is it also the platforms that you want to reach those audiences on? Uh, or is the message also completely different? All of the above, actually. All of the above, okay. So, uh, you, sort of select, you select the platform based on uh, what their reach is. You select the communication based on what your audience is. You select the technology, what best, uh, you know, suits the kind of campaign and which gives you the best efficiencies. So right. I can't say one of the uh, elements which you mentioned, I guess we will have to look at all of the above and it's not difficult at all because of the uh, latest programmatic latest AI ML technologies, which we all are currently using for our campaign uh, managements. I think we are seamlessly doing all, all of these things. Makes sense, makes sense. Thanks, Vinod. Uh, so Chandni, Thank for you, I mean, a, just the uh, main question which we talked about, what is what has changed or what is evolving in terms of branding. But secondly, I would, uh, was very curious to know your views on some of these new age brands, which by the very nature of their services, which are, you know, most sophisticated, let's like say, you know, just taking examples, but Upstocks or Dream11 or some of these, right? They are never going to be like, like an Upstocks is unlikely to be a, a Bharat brand, right? It's not going to, it's at least to start off with, it's not, its audience is not that, but even they are relying very heavily on impact properties. I mean, A, you could say that, you know, everybody has to be on cricket in India. So th that's one way of looking at it, but they've sort of led with, impact properties if you look at it right so can you can you maybe give us an if you have any insights on yeah on what, I, feel what like, wrong? I feel like for these brands the most important thing right now is to kind of capture market share like mm. for up stocks or for dream 11 market share is the game that they're playing so how do you really do that by increasing your search of uh you know your voice in terms of the, the higher search volumes so the, it, it kind of makes sense for them to do this from that perspective in terms of kind of really capturing market share. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what Cred has done. That's what Dream11 is doing. All of them are playing the valuation game, increasing their customer base as much as they can. So therefore, that marketing strategy makes a lot of sense. Um, right. For, yeah. George, I think uh, just to add on this one, uh, because it's a... Uh, uh, indeed a very deep thought uh, what a lot of people ask like why brands are impact uh, investing on impact versus the regular digital uh, i think if you see the last three years uh, digital audience has become numb because the way we are consuming content uh, the attention span is going drastically down on all the platforms and uh, if you do some sort of uh, there are now tools coming in which is doing uh, the eye gazing movement uh, engagement sort of on the creatives on the platform uh, time of the day, what device you are consuming, what's the theme of the creative. Uh, so with these tools, if you do a little bit more research, I think live sports and impact property is still one of the medium which has high attention span uh, compared to some of the social platforms, uh, regular video content where 
ads are just running and the attention span of consumer is not as high as it should be to get into a brand recall. This is one key factor, which is also bringing brand again to the old school thought that the life sports and the impact property, although there is a spillover, uh, yeah. they are not a Bharat brand. And they do see that in the next five years also, uh, that audience might not be able to catch up uh, with their product offering or might not be get to evolve. But I think with that spillover also, the attention span is able to drive better ROI compared to the regular digital, uh, where uh, the ads are just spraying painting. There is viewability, which the I would say half a decade back, we all started debating about whether the ads are viewed or not. But now the new currency that brands are looking is more on attention. Uh, yeah. Ads are all viewed, uh, but is the consumer attentive enough uh, to engage with the brand and with the ad? Yeah, that that makes sense, Varad. So, I mean, you're saying that it even in terms of uh, effectiveness, some of these impact properties uh, are are beating. Yeah, uh, and especially at given the increase in consumption, digital, it makes sense. Chandni, just going back, uh, like couple of changes or trends you've seen in, in branding, anything uh, so, uh, I know that Aditi mentioned. So we are seeing a massive shift in terms of spends from traditional to digital. Yeah. Uh, a lot on the branding side of it. Before digital used to be largely more bottom funnel focused. Now branding has become a significant buy from that standpoint. OTTs have become quite big from that standpoint. Like, you know, we're doing, we just did a really large campaign for one of our clients, phone pay uh, yeah. you know, on Hotstar. Really like significant spends compared to what, you know, clients have been spending on, um, on uh, you know, digital. Yeah. yeah. Also, I feel like from another important trend that I'm seeing is, I'm going to state some examples because everything Aditi and Vinod have said are really the key trends that are, are there. So I'm going to just talk about, you know, how I'm seeing that happen on some of our brands. So like I said, uh, spends are shifting, uh, and I've seen that recently with phone pay uh, on OTT. Amazon is a client of ours. So for them, vernacular has become extremely important. It's about, you know, they themselves have launched in different languages. So, yeah. you know, so the idea is that, of course, they are going after the Bharat audience. And how do you really tap, you know, tap into that? So, you know, we really have, like, we've created like a performance um, a production unit just to create that level of personalization when it comes to banners like 15,000 20,000 banners you know created for a particular audience in that particular language you know really to ensure that that sort of messaging is going on so you know vernacular is another vernacular no personalization of communication and agility of that communication both of these things have become extremely important as a trend. And a third trend that I'm seeing um, is influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. That is one trend also that, you know, nowadays, like whenever we are running any campaigns for our clients, influencer marketing is definitely like a part of the entire mix. So influence, like, and literally from everything from celebrities to regional influencers in a small, uh, you know, tier two uh, town, you know, it, like brands are deploying all of those strategies you know if they want to create impact then let's go out you know go, go all out within you know celebrities and if they really want to go you know deeper they are kind of utilizing regional influencers also in terms of communication also platforms are becoming really important like i'll tell you for amazon uh, when we're trying to tap into the bharat audience we're also looking at apps like moj yeah. Joe, you know um mx takatak all of these apps are also becoming really important from that standpoint because the content is, uh, you know, the Bharat is consuming that content largely. So, you know, a lot of focus on the right kind of platform communication and therefore, and agility in terms of being at the right place at the right time, you know, it's, 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 that's the game plan. So yeah, these are some of the trends and some brands are actually deploying it really well. Yeah, absolutely. I think vernacular is obviously a big trend and I'm going to plug in the fact that LinkedIn launched in Hindi uh, just last week as well. So clearly it's something that everybody is, is investing in. Yeah. I was just curious from an influencer marketing perspective, Chandni, is is the measurement of, of effectiveness evolving or is it just like you've got X followers or, you know, on, on Instagram or whatever, and hence it's sort of in proportion to that or, or is there more to that? So there are tools. That are, uh, I think we use, uh, I think, Unbox Social and Chorus. I, I believe, I'm not really sure on the names of the tools, but I think these are the two tools that we use. 
but along with that there is a lot of manual intervention also that goes in from our influencer marketing team to you know and some of the properties that we suggest in terms of uh, influencer marketing is you know using of instagram stories where there are clear swipe ups and then we get them to tag the you know website urls therefore you understand that you know if this influencer did do you know did you get enough swipe ups did you get enough traffic coming from your you know instagram leads so we measure engagement in in various forms yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. we are and we are putting like you know unique links across all of these um, activities to ensure that we are getting some form of measurement in fact a very good form of measurement it can't yeah. get better yeah makes sense very interesting chandni uh bharat uh, coming to you, i i mean uh, a i know on the trends part there's lots been covered so but if there is something uh, beyond that that you've seen but i would really have to get your perspective given uh, you know your recent exposure to the the region as such apac if there are anything that's unique uh, or, or you know what are the nuances between india and some of the the other regions uh, if if there are if you could give us some insights on that from a brand building perspective um i think uh, i completely echo uh, whatever thoughts uh, aditi vt and channi has already covered and uh, definitely on the short form video uh, whether it's uh, uh, the the bharat sort of video content or uh, what you say the india content on instagram reel uh, the social commerce is picking up uh, and there are learnings from other markets how they see social commerce getting developed uh, there are big learnings what we have in china or in australia Uh, within the region, uh, where we have seen how brands are uh, doing end-to-end -end measurement on the social commerce piece, and uh, this actually one of the medium which I would say fits uh, in a good position both on the top funnel, or driving that brand comms, video narrative, creative engagement content, and definitely on the lower funnel also because brand can easily measure whether the influencer has drive any sort of sales. or what type of conversion models they can build in so there is a good roi mechanism which the social commerce has brought into the game so yeah. that's one element uh, rest i think on the india side if i see from other markets and india there is a big catch up which we are doing on the connected tv side uh, so there is around about 8 to 10 million devices in india uh, and if i compare with other markets uh, all the ratio is quite big but the learnings what we get from other advanced markets we have already seen the curve from linear to connected tv uh, is clearly that how agencies come on board and help brands into creating a marketing plan which is single view of consumer whether the consumer is watching on linear or connected tv so there are uh, acr panels which are being developed in most the markets for you to understand what content consumer are watching in and with this connected uh, tv space which is primarily metro phenomena right now in india uh, i think the brand marketing is getting evolved so recent example is uh, we did a skoda kushak launch in india and we had learnings from our uk team how they did that launch on an amazon uh, in uk uh, so the whole element of uh, we doing that launch in india was not just to uh, take the learnings from there but we identify that india as a market we are still a fire stick market heavily when it comes to the ctv so we partnered with amazon fire stick uh, created a engagement sort of a creative on the masthead of amazon fire stick so when the consumer launched on the day of the launch of the car they were able to engage uh, with the creative and using the same uh, amazon uh, a, a feature of uh, how you rotate uh, the interior exteriors of the car the consumer was able to see a 360 view of a car on the connected tv so that's actually give you a purpose of engagement driven uh, top of the funnel branding but end of the day because you are measuring who are these consumers you have the login ids and all you can again do a remarketing into the lower funnel understand whether the leads was filled and whether the consumer has reached to a test drive stage or have they bought the car so that way i think new frameworks of marketing are being developed and uh, india is also i think uh, at a fast pace catching up uh, this new uh, i would say device way of uh, doing a holistic planning and uh, currently when we see i think last quarter kanta released a report which says uh, in rural also digital is now the second most consumed medium next to tv uh, and how in india we are now seeing uh, the lines getting blurred between connected tv and the ott consumption on mobile device uh, so this is again a good phenomena for india to understand that how these two worlds still sit in a different uh, environment in silos but how as a brand you can see into a single view of consumer uh, understanding what content they are consuming on different platforms yeah i do remember seeing the the skoda creative on fire stick is uh, pretty interesting 
Uh, thanks for that, Bharat. So as we as we look to wind up, I'm going to put all of you on the spot a little and maybe uh, just ask all of you to name one trend, theme, you know, call it what you may, that's going to be big in 2022, right? Or, you know, let's say like 22 and 23, like the next year to two years. Uh, so uh, Bharat, do you have, what do you have in mind? Mm, I would say uh, unlocking the value of first party data. First party, yeah. Okay. Chandni? Personalization of communication. Personalization makes sense. Uh, Aditi? I think uh, agility of uh, data usage because there is data everywhere and that's the challenge I feel with digital. We have lots of data, yeah. but how are we agile in using it on uh, one single place? I think that's the big thing which is going to happen. Makes sense. Vinod? I think uh, a marriage between the ad tech and martech. That's something which is... Uh, which can really create magic. And that's exactly what I feel that an agency and a client partnership can do. I'm just going back to the first question, which you asked, yeah. Manu, just to close the circle. I guess that's where the, the value of partnership comes together. Makes sense, makes sense. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you. I really appreciate uh, your thoughts and insights. And thank you so much. For the time, uh, Aditi, Vinod, Chani, and Bharat. Um, uh, hopefully, the the audience will find this uh, interesting and insightful as well. And uh, hopefully, you know all of the themes that you mentioned play out uh, over the next uh, year to two years. Uh, but it's it's interesting times. And I know we said we want to talk a little bit about cookie less as well. But then we also realize that that's a it's 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 a it's a eight hundred pound gorilla. So it's not going to get covered as as part of one panel. Uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll find time to talk about that in the future as well. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. And I think uh, that also brings us to the, uh, to the end of our, of our agency connect event. And thank you to everyone who joined in to, uh, today. So thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. And thank thank you, you to the LinkedIn team. Thank yeah. you very much. And to the exchange for media team as well. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Cheers.